Hi there. Welcome once again to our study in Revelations. Today we are in Revelations chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 9 and we're going to go down to the end of 22. We're going to finish the letter that we started last time that Jesus wrote to the Church of Philadelphia. We will finish that letter and then we will do the letter that he wrote to Laodicea. Two completely different churches, two completely different situations, but very applicable to all of us when we look at these things. And I think it's very important for us to read this and I believe there's, we're gonna get a lot of encouragement and a lot of how-tos today in how we can walk our walk with the Lord, how we can be warm for the Lord and not just lukewarm. We can be who He wants us to be. What an encouragement it is to be disciplined by the Lord. We're gonna talk about that today and what our reaction to His discipline should be. Once again, thank you for joining me in our study in Revelations. We are in, Revel as I mentioned already, in Revelations chapter 3, and we're starting at verse 9. We're partway through the letter to the church at Philadelphia. We're going to continue on with our letter. Just let me read the first two verses here, 7 and 8 of this letter, and then we'll pick up our commentary on verse 9. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. When he opens, no one can shut, and when he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. So up to this point in the letter, as we talked about last time, we see that God opens the door and even though they don't have strength, they have not denied the name of God and he will give them strength to walk through that door. He continues on in verse 9, he says, I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. So this is, I think, dealing with a lot of these people who are coming and trying to get the Gentile churches back into Judaism. We know it was a huge issue with Paul. It's why Paul wrote most of his letters. In Acts chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas and some others went to Jerusalem to meet with the elders and the apostles to see what God's heart was for the Gentiles because these Jewish people were coming claiming to be something, but trying to force the Gentile people back into Judaism and practicing the things of Judaism. Now, remember, these letters to the seven churches of Asia are to Gentiles. These are not to Jewish peoples. These letters are not to Jewish congregations. They're to Gentile congregations. So he says, I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, they are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. To be a Jew means to be a worshiper of God. So he says they claim to be Jewish, but they're not. They may have the ancestor of being uh, Israeli, but they, they're not following God. They're not worshiping him, right? Verse 10, it goes on and says, Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who are living on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one can take your crown. He's telling them something that's coming, right? Since you have kept my command and endured patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come. There's a trial coming. There's a tribulation that, that's going to come, right? It's going to come upon the whole world. Not just a small portion of the world, but upon the whole world. And it's going to test those who are living on this earth. Now, there's a lot of theories about whether Christians are going to be here or not going to be there. With Some are going to be taken, some aren't. All these things. I'm not going to get into that today. We're, we're just reading the Word and listening to what the Word is coming. He says, I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. This is the thing we have to say. I am coming soon. Do not slack off. 
Hang on to the truth. Don't let somebody persuade you to, to go the other way. Because this is what's happening in the church today. This is what's happening around the world today. There are so many voices out there saying, this is the way, this is the way. No, do this. No, follow this. And we get away from following Jesus, who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So we have these people that are trying to present gospels that are leading people away. And so he says, hang on to what you have. Hang on to the truth. Hang on to your relationship with God. Hang on to, to the fact that Jesus is the one who came and gave his life so that we could have eternal life. Hang on to those things so that you do not lose your crown. To him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. He's just encouraging us. What an encouragement it is here, right? This is what's going to happen. You're going to be a pillar in the temple of God. Never again to leave it. Always being in the temple. What is the temple? The presence of God, right? The temple is God's presence. So we'll never be without that. We'll be there. We'll have a new name written. Remember, he's saying to these people, I know that you are weak. I know that you're not really strong, but I know that you are holding against Satan and against those who are trying to mislead you. And he says, just hang on. Whatever it takes for you to do that, hang on to the Word of God. Hang on to the things of God. Even if you feel beat up, even if you feel overwhelmed by the world and those around about you, just hang on because the time is coming, right? And this is what he says to them, right? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Just listen to what God has to say, right? Amen. And then here we go on to the letter to the last church, to Laodicea. It says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Jesus, right? Amen. He is the one that he's talking about. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold or hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spew you out of my mouth. Can you imagine hearing these words? But there's many of us that are like that, right? There's many of us who are lukewarm. We're not passionate for Jesus. We're not passionate for Satan. We're not passionate for righteousness or for wrong. We're not committed in any way. We're these ones who are walking down the fence and we're not sure which way we're going. Then Jesus says, I, I don't like that, right? I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. You're not committed or you're not to either way. You're just waffling along. You're like these drivers in Malawi when we drive. Oftentimes we see these guys, they drive down the middle of the road so they can decide which way they're going to go. There's two lanes and they're driving down the middle because then they can go to whichever lane and they're blocking the rest of the traffic, right? They're only thinking about themselves and they're ready to jump any lane. And that's what he's talking about. People like this. They're not committed. They're not committed to this lane or to that lane. They're just running in the middle, right? They're just they're lukewarm. They're not hot or cold. And he says, I would rather you were either hot or cold. But because you're not hot or cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You know, when you drink a coffee, you can have cold coffee, iced coffee. That's what tastes pretty good. Or you can have hot coffee and that tastes pretty good. But lukewarm coffee is just not, doesn't taste so good, right? So this is what he's saying to them, that we have to be committed in what we're doing, right? Because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. This is a serious thing. Like, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. It's going to be too late for you. You need to change what you're doing. You need to either warm up or cool down. You need to either go to the side of Satan or to the side of God. And you need to make a choice, right? Verse 17, he says, You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth. I do not need a thing. But you do not realize... You are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. If we are depending on the wealth of this world, we are lost. That's all there is to it. You are lost. The wealth of this world is not going to affect eternity. The wealth of this world is only going to affect the days that you have on this earth. The days on this earth are the only things that can make a difference for you. 
Your wealth is only going to be of any value while you are on this earth because it's part of the flesh and this flesh is for this world. If we're putting all our energy and all our time trying to amass things for this world, then we're going to lose out on the world that comes. This is wrong and this is what we have to watch, right? He says, you say I'm rich. I have required wealth. I do not need a thing. You can think that you have all the material things of this world that you have all kinds of riches, that you don't need anything from God or anybody else. But what does he say? You say I'm rich, but you do not realize that you are wretched, that you are pitiful, that you're poor, that you're blind, and that you're naked. You don't realize the depths to which you have fallen. Because the wealth that you have, the riches you have, are not going to bring you salvation. They're not going to bring you the things you need. Yes, you may be comfortable in this life, but this life only lasts for a short time. When you die, the old saying, there's no U-Hauls behind the hearse. Like there's nobody hauling all your material possessions to put in the grave with you. You're going to be in a wooden box just like a pauper is. Just like somebody off the street who dies. They're going to go in the ground. You're going to go in the ground. You come into this world with nothing. You leave this world with that. These riches of this world are not going to be of any value to you. What you need to realize that if you are counting your wealth, your riches of this world, then you're missing out on the true thing. But that's why he says, you do not realize you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Why? Because you have not received from the Lord the true riches, eternal life, the things that he has for us. Verse 18, let's go on. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, white clothes to wear so you can cover your shame and nakedness, and sound to put on your eyes so you can see. He's using worldly things here to show us what our need is. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire. He's talking about the spirit. He's not talking about physical gold. He's not talking about getting a big lump of gold from God that's been totally refined by fire. No, he's talking about a refining that goes on in us. The riches of heaven, the riches of the spirit that are in us. And he's talking about having white clothes to wear. He's talking about righteousness. He's talking about being washed in the blood of the Lord. He's talking about us being cleansed of our dirtiness and our filth, of walking in whiteness that he gives for us so that we can cover our shameful nakedness and salve to put on our eyes so we can see. We need to have salve. We need to have the Holy Spirit so we can see the Word of God, so we can see the things of God. We walk by faith, not by sight. Sight will get you into trouble. Faith will be like a salve to our, our eyes that will help us to see what's happening in the spirit realm, what's happening around about us. We can think that we are rich when we have many things of this material world, but when we don't have the things of the Spirit, then we are poor. We have no gold. We have no clothes. We are naked, shameful. We can't see with our eyes. And this is what he's saying to us. Turn away from those things of the world and come to me to receive these things. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. What a word he's saying here, right? I'm giving you this discipline because I love you. Every parent knows that if you love your child, you're going to discipline them. When I look today and I see a lot of people refusing to discipline their children, I think, you, you don't know what's coming. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know the struggle you're going to have because you are refusing to discipline your children. Because you're, you're going to be in big trouble. We have uh, daughters here that we raised here that are, have young children. And we tell them, you know, when the kids are expressing their will and they're being strong, you know, you have to bring this thing into line. You have to teach this child what no means. Because if you don't do it now when they're two and three years old, you're going to be fighting with them for the rest of your life. And you're going to really struggle. Because that's our nature, right? Our nature. We have to learn what no is. We have to learn how we walk in society. And what we see around us now is people that never learned that. And they're struggling in this world, right? God rebukes and disciplines those whom he loves. When you feel rebuked and disciplined by God, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's not a shameful thing. It's just something that we all go through. It's something that we all go through. 
rebuke and discipline is about teaching. It's not punishment. He's not punishing us. No, he's rebuking us, saying, no, you're going the wrong way, just like you would a child. No, don't put your hand on that stove. That stove is very hot. That's going to burn your hand. You're rebuking that child because you don't want him to burn his hand. You're trying to teach him that when the stove is on, do not put your hand on there or you're going to suffer real painful consequences. So they need to learn to listen to you. They need to learn to know what no is. And when, when mom or dad or grandma or grandpa say something, they need to learn that they must be obedient because it is for their safety. You're not doing it to be mean. You're doing it because you love them. And it's the same thing with the father. He, dis he rebukes and disciplines us because he loves us. So what does he say? So be earnest and repent. When you feel that God is rebuking you or disciplining you, what should we do? We should be earnest. We should be sincere, true in our heart. Yes, Lord, this is the way we need to repent and turn away from those things, right? Repent means two things. Under the old covenant, it means to turn and walk down a different road. Under the new covenant, it means to have a change of our thinking, our understanding. Like it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, do not be conformed in the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Change your thinking. So that's what you're doing when you're trying to train a child. You're trying to change their thinking. Oh, I can put my hand on there if, you, if I want. No, you can't. If you put your hand on there, you're going to get burned. You can't do what you want. You have to listen to those who are in authority over you. And so when God rebukes us or disciplines us, we must be earnest in receiving the lessons that he's given us and quick to repent. Amen? And that's what it says in Romans chapter 2. It says... Uh, verse 4, do you not know that it is the patience and kindness of God that brings us to repentance? When God is patient and kind with us, rebuking us, teaching us, disciplining us, that brings us to repentance because we know that he still loves us. He loves us because he cares about us. I know when I said to my own children when we were raising them in Canada and all the children we've raised here, I tell them like, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't discipline you. You know, because, you know, they get the big long faces when you're disciplined and trying to tell them, no, this isn't something you're allowed to do. This isn't something you're supposed to be doing. I'm disciplining you because I love you. If I don't love you, I'll just let you go do whatever you want. I'll just let you go do whatever you want. You can put your hand on the stove and you're going to burn your hand, right? Amen. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Do you hear God knocking? Do you hear Jesus knocking at the door with you? Listen, if you don't have an expectation of God speaking to you, if you don't have an expectation that Jesus is knocking at the door, you're not going to hear it. But what does he say? Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens it, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. When the Lord is rebuking us, when he is disciplining us, do we hear it? Do we listen to what he says? Because if we do then he will come in and he will eat with us and he'll be with us. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. What a powerful word, right? That he's going to, we're going to be in the presence of God. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. So what a powerful word we have for us today. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for this letter that we have. We thank you for the letter that you wrote to Philadelphia, Lord, and just encouraging us. And we thank you for this letter that you also wrote to Laodicea. Help us not to be lukewarm, Father, but to, to take our commitment with you and stand there. Let us listen to what you say, that you knock on the door, and that the door is open to us. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity we have to share your word. Father, we pray it goes far and wide that you would touch the hearts of many people. And for those who are struggling in these areas, Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would just touch them, that you would encourage them, that you would lift them up in Jesus' name. We just thank you, Father, for your goodness and your love and for this opportunity. Pray, Father, that this, this videos go out far and wide. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's been great to be together with you going through these letters of the seven churches. And next time we will start in chapter four, we finish the letters and we'll go on to what Jesus wants to reveal about himself in the book of Revelations of Jesus. 
Till then, remember, God loves you, and so do I. Okay, girls, take us home.